Welcome, teacher friend. I'm Lori. And I'm Melissa. We are two literacy educators in Baltimore. We want the best for all kids, and we know you do too. Our district recently adopted a new literacy curriculum, which meant a lot of change for everyone. Lori and I can't wait to keep learning about literacy with you today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Melissa and Lori Love Literacy, Literacy Podcast. We are thrilled to talk today to a new literacy friend. We (laughs) cannot wait to hear everything she has to say about, oh my gosh, about knowledge, about oral reading, about oral language and, and all the things knowledge building. Melissa, I know you're, you're really excited too. <laughs> yeah. So today we have Sonia Cabell and we're really excited to have her. I, I'm really excited because, you know, I, I still, I feel like I'm seeing more and more of this like idea of science of reading and people saying it's just the phonics, it's just the mm-hmm. decoding, it's just word recognition. And I love, love, love that Sonia is doing research right now <laughs> about the other side of the reading rope, about the language comprehension, and she's going to tell us all about it today. So welcome. welcome. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We're so <laughs> glad that you said yes to podcasting with us. We are thrilled to talk with you because we could talk knowledge building all day. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. One and I'm excited. To, I'm so excited to be here. And I love the kind of back and forth you have with your guests. So I'm excited to be a part of that. Oh, cool. Well, thanks. <laughs> Would you mind starting us off with just a little bit about yourself? We know you Absolutely. have a, a really interesting story, I think, anyway. <laughs> Anyone who is a second grade teacher is like automatically has a great story. <laughs> Aww, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, currently I'm an assistant, I'm an associate professor. I'm sorry. I just demoted myself. I'm an, associate, <laughs> I'm an associate professor at Florida State University in the School of Teacher Education and in the Florida Center for Reading Research. And my work focuses on um, studying the prevention of reading difficulties um, and really about how children develop uh, and how we can help them develop uh, strong language skills, strong language comprehension early on. And my work also focuses on integrating uh, developing those language skills through content uh, instruction as well. Uh, So I did start as a second grade teacher in Oklahoma. um, And I then became a reading coach during the reading first era. So I was a, I was a reading first coach in both Oklahoma and in Virginia. Um, And I, I love the primary grades. In fact, I, my hats off. I think one of you is a middle school teacher. Melissa, are you? Yeah, that was me. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) My hats off to anybody who can teach uh, third grade and up because, (laughs) and especially middle school to me, middle school is the scariest time, was the scariest time of my personal life. Uh, So um, I, I really focus on the, the younger grades and the primary grades and really about laying a foundation for later literacy learning. Um, and then when I was in Virginia, I um, found out about the uh, doctoral program actually through a book I would use in the classroom. I used Words Their Way at the time in the classroom oh, yeah, that was yeah, written. Yeah. And Marcia Invernizzi was one of the authors. And so she, um, I met with her at University of Virginia and, and I learned what a PhD program was all about. And I had no idea. I had no <laughs> idea. I thought you had, I thought to myself in order to um, be, Take, do a PhD, you had to first be like a principal. And I'm like, I'm never going to be a principal of a school. So maybe oh I'm gosh. never going to get my PhD. So that that's not true for anybody out there who might think <laughs> that you first have to be a principal to get your PhD. Um, that is not true at all. Um, so uh, yeah, so I studied reading education there at the University of Virginia. That's so cool. So you just jumped right into that program. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, uh, you know, I, I did. I had uh, my master's in reading education. I was always really interested in um, reading because mm-hmm. I think reading and teaching kids to read lays a foundation for everything. You know, when I was a second grade teacher, um, reading was always one of the critically most important things to teach, and. There was a particular child that still sticks in my mind who we couldn't, I couldn't help. And she wasn't able to retain the learning. And she hadn't, she was in second grade and she really couldn't read at all. Couldn't decode any words. And 
Unfortunately, I would use practices that are not scientifically based, that we know now are not scientifically based, like drilling with flashcards and things like this. And she didn't retain any of that. And I was wondering, like, what do we do with her? And so I feel like that is one person who has stuck with me that makes me think about, that made me kind of think about wanting to get my master's and wanting to get my PhD in reading education and how can we help students um, learn to read. Um, And then when I got into my doctoral program, I really began to be interested through Laura Justice's work. Dr. Laura Justice is is now at the Ohio State University Mm -hmm. and um, she's an early childhood researcher. And she, um, through working with her um, during my doctoral program and learning from her, I became interested in the prevention of reading difficulties and intervening in preschool um, and particularly how important language and developing oral language skills are to all aspects of reading and particularly to language comprehension. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to ask you next is um, I, I pulled out a quote from I forget exactly which article that you sent us <laughs> it was in, but it said, the knowledge that we bring to a text is the key determinant in how much we understand that text. Um, and I was just like thinking like, how, okay, how did you get from your, your in grad school to you're interested in helping students learn how to read to like that focus on knowledge? That's a really good question. And it's quite a story, actually. Um, <laughs> I do want to say, though, that... Um, I can't take credit for that wonderful quote. I believe it's like Anderson and Pearson. I think yeah, um, right, yeah. Yeah, which is good. And I actually wrote it oh. down. Um, and I thought Melissa read my mind when I was looking at our show notes here. I was like, how did you know that that was the quote I highlighted too? She's like, I didn't. So you know, it's the quote I highlight too. And a lot of researchers highlight because it's, you know, and it, in re- researchers, we only like quote things that are really well said in a way that, you can't say another say, way. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. um, and, and, and I don't know whether, I don't know whether I directly quoted them there, but really that is attributed. I attribute that to them, yeah. but how did I, you know, the, how I became interested in content knowledge really has to do with more of a, my preschool um, research background. So in my, uh, in my work about, uh, that I was involved in with, 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 uh, Laura Justice uh, during grad school and then after grad school. So we're talking about the the mid to late 2000s. Um, we were doing studies that uh, where we would help teachers to be conversationally responsive partners with children. Um, the language learning, and you know, there was research showing that language learning environments um, were, were not optimal for young children, particularly young children um, living in poverty um, in, in school settings. And so we were thinking, well, how can we help teachers learn how to help children develop their language? And the kind of language I was interested in was the language that the language of books, the language of texts, what some people call academic language. Um, you know, we, we, as we're growing up, we're learning spoken language just by our conversations with, um, right. with more able, um, speaking partners and we learn language naturally. However, there are aspects of language um, that are still language. So I don't think it's something totally, academic language is something totally different. But the way we speak, we use words uh, that um, are, are, are much more common, much, much less complicated, much less complex. But in written language, even in a simple book that we might read to preschoolers, mm-hmm. there's many more instances of what rare words, which are words that you know, only appear a certain number of times, um, usually at a, that something that a fourth grader or above would know. Mm -hmm. There are many, the syntax, you know, when we read something, the syntax is totally different in written language than Mm -hmm. in how I would speak it right now. Mm -hmm. So if young children aren't being exposed to written language through read alouds, where are they getting the exposure to those rare words? Where are they getting exposure to that complex syntax um, because the conversations by themselves aren't doing it. Right. Now, in training teachers to be conversationally responsive partners, we were doing that work. And what we found was similar to what other researchers were finding, that we were able to help teachers have more conversations with children, and children were talking more, and there were more back and forths, and maybe teachers were even asking more open-ended questions. However, teachers... Um, we're not 
um, necessarily having conversations that would extend, expand children's um, thinking or expand their, their, the discussion uh, to build on children's ideas Mm -hmm. through these techniques of just training people how, uh, you know, teaching people how to have better conversations. And, um, you know, it was really inspired for me by the, the, the con the content area interest was really inspired by a couple Mm -hmm. of things. And one of them was, I was at a, um, conference where I was presenting findings from these conversational responsive studies that were mixed in that we were able to do things that, um, that showed some impact on students' language, but not the impact on the standardized language measures that you're hoping to see, the more general language measures, like standardized vocabulary um, or syntax. And there were other people who were presenting at the same conference, uh, research conference, that were saying similar things. And uh, the, the great Catherine Snow of Harvard University was our discussant. I don't know if she remembers saying this. I don't even know if she <laughs> remembers me. But um, she said something that stuck with me, and that it was maybe we need to give teachers and children something to talk about. Coupled with that, a couple years later, I did a, um, I did a study where I looked at um, – preschool teachers and their, the, um, the language modeling that they were doing in different contexts in, um, during book reading, during science, during social studies, during, um, and and during all of these different activity areas and found that when teachers were doing science, when they were teaching science and book reading was a close one that was in the mix too here, they were, using um, language uh, strategies more naturally mm-hmm. to both think to do things like asking open-ended questions, engaging children in those rich conversations as back and forth conversations, building their co- conceptual understanding by, you know, building on what they're saying. So it was more than, it, it was more than just talk. It was the integration of, you know, I saw it as, huh, there's something special going on here that maybe we can build on where teachers are already naturally doing some of the things that we're hoping for them to do. Can I ask a a question that might be a silly question? There are no silly questions when they're not talking about the content, right? And I'm, I have an idea in my head of what the, the conversation might be like that. But I'm curious from your perspective, like, can you describe a before? Because I think I have a good idea of the after, like of the the content rich conversation or the content rich open ended questions. Mm-hmm. What did it look like before? Like what? OK, what was that like? <laughs> so let me try to answer in a couple of ways. So let's go before before first before before would be, <laughs> let's say, teachers asking a lot of closed ended questions. OK, I would yes. say that this happens all the time still. So. Uh, you know, a teacher, um, we had a scenario where we had teachers uh, in our in our PD sessions where we had teachers playing with Play-Doh. This were pre- these were preschool teachers. And we we said, um, if, let's imagine you're playing with Play-Doh and here's a child and they role played. The number one go-to question. What is teachers, your favorite color of Play-Doh? What color is it? Uh, Not what even what is, is your it? favorite color? Both of which are close-ended questions because yeah. they require only a one-word response to be adequate. But what color is it? And we were trying. We, we had already done all of this like discussion and training about t- about how do you ask, how do you change those close-ended questions to open-ended questions? Like, what are you making? What are you doing? You know, <laughs> how does this feel? Or whatever you know. Um, mm-hmm. Versus, um, so in a a lot of times, too, um, uh, uh, researchers, um, Henry Heinemann and Barbara Wasik from Temple University have highlighted that sometimes teachers will also ask an open-ended question, but immediately follow it up with a closed-ended question. Like, they'll ask oh, a question, but not stop and wait. So is that helpful? to imme- They're immediately assuming kids can't answer it, so need some, cl- some sort of scaffold there before right. even waiting. Okay. That's so, helpful for like, so that's, so that's like step one, like, okay, we're, we're trying to shift from just the close to now a little bit more open, but mm-hmm. 
It seems like there's like three phases here. That was like the <laughs> phase one, close-ended questions. Phase two, now we're going to, right. to get to open-ended questions, but may not have some things to talk about. And then phase three right. is like the content-rich conversation. Am I Lori, I think that's a really smart that. way of capturing it. Um, maybe, you, maybe you should write about it. Maybe we could, we could write about <laughs> no, it. No, <laughs> you're so but much you, better than me. <laughs> <laughs> you do it. <laughs> so I think what you're saying, like the open-ended questions, what that does is it helps the conversation move back and for, forth. It is actually setting you up then for those language-enriching strategies, Okay. So okay. you have those open-ended questions, but it's not just stopping there, right? That allows the conversation to occur rather than I say something, you have a response and I say, good job. Right. And I move on to the next topic. Um, and yeah. so there is this idea of asking open-ended questions and then extending what kids are saying, listening to what children are saying extending their ideas. And you could do this by adding information or adding an idea to something they said to make it more complete or probing back to them, asking them a follow-up question, building on it. So not just letting it be like, I ask an open-ended question, you respond, good job. Because that's a conversation stopper. You want to engage children. Right. You know, the content helps engage the mind, give something to discuss that's worthy of discussion, that's worthy of curiosity, it's worthy of attention, um, and so I would say not all conversations are exactly the same. And I would say that this date, I think we need, do need more from a research perspective. We do need more data on, on the conversations in content rich classrooms, uh, which is something I'm interested in kind of digging deeper into in the, in the primary grades. So well, funny. we can't wait I'm, to read that research. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm currently writing curriculum and I'm like furiously Ooh, taking notes here. Like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> check your, check the questions you ask. <laughs> yes. And like, you know, the, and also like the level of question, right? Some things are yeah. uh, literally right there, literal and then inferential. It's that inferential thinking that we want to move students toward to really think and read between the lines and understand more deeply and engage and what better way of engaging than integrating with things that they care about or are interested in? Yeah. Um, and con okay. content just leaves a, ha provides a very good basis for it. And unfortunately, in the early grades, it's been given a short shrift in terms of time. And I know that, um, you know, um, P. David Pearson likes to say that it's the, the reading became the bully. Uh, in, in, and that's, I think there's a lot of truth to that, that in the early 2000s, the focus became on reading and the length of instructional time given to reading was so much mm -hmm. that there wasn't, in the early grades, you know, that there wasn't a lot of time for content area teaching. And in our, those things have been historically in, in our system separated. So we mm -hmm. have like a ELA textbook adoption, and then we have other textbook adoptions, right? So, and, or teachers might say, we only do content. We only teach science every other day or half the year and social studies mm -hmm. half the year. I've heard that in kindergarten. I've heard that, you know, some people are also substituting their content area with the content rich English language arts programs, which isn't what a lot of those programs were designed for. There's right. a lot of great things about those programs, but it isn't yeah. what they were necessarily designed for. But so that we do have a, you know, an issue that's broader than like a, you know, I don't think teachers should feel guilty um, it's much broader than the teacher and school even. And it's it's a, a larger issue that needs to be fixed. Yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> All of those things do happen. <laughs> yeah. So I'm wondering like where this is happening well. Like are there and, – and what does this look like when it's happening well? And like how can we help have an impact and support teachers to – have this happen well for them or, or have them learn what does content rich conversation look like? And mm -hmm. I'm even curious, like down the road, not this moment, but how this translates to writing. I don't know if you know anything yeah. about that, but <laughs> that's what well, I'm thinking of. Writing <laughs> is another <laughs> true love. Writing is another true love of mine. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. And I think that it probably happens well in a lot of places. And, it, and there's, um, and that there are, let me just describe, how about, how about, let me just talk a little bit about what it might look like. Um, and one key piece. So there's been a, a lot of research on book reading, reading aloud to children. 
Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of benefits of reading aloud to children. So we we talked about some of them, that books uh, contain more rare words, than what, they're more complex texts. A lot of the things we read aloud to children are usually a couple of grade levels above where from when they can read that on their own. So they're exposed to different types of texts, different genres, because even in content-rich learning, there's can be a variety of genres, both fiction, mm-hmm. informational, narrative. Um, and um, the not just so, but not just the book itself. There's a lot of research around the extra textual talk, the talk that happens outside of the exact words that are read. And that has been studied in, in, in um, you know, the vocabulary instruction that goes on during the reading of the text. Um, the conversations that might go on during and after, um, bef- what happens before. So there's there are these pieces that um, ha- of these content rich approaches, and read aloud is a big vehicle that is being used in in integrating content and uh, literacy in the early grades um, because that content appro- and in, that approach of content and literacy integration really happens with content in oral language mm-hmm. in the early grades, especially. Um, it's not, it's not necessarily always happening with the texts that students are able to read themselves. Although some programs try to, uh, build knowledge through the texts that students are reading themselves in the early grades too. But most, I would say in the early grades, K2 are doing it through read alouds. And, um, so the, the research base on read alouds is pretty rich that the, that read aloud is a context in which conversations can occur that can enrich students um uh you know language skills uh and it provides a vehicle for delivering some of that content um but it's also important to note that the goal isn't like getting through the book <laughs> right cuz some of the books like some 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 um content, you know, books that, you know, the authors aren't writing them. So they're thinking, they're not thinking about your read aloud when they write. these. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think. (laughs) Um, And so it is perfectly okay to read part of a text, um, read, um, and then read the rest of it later, or um, to even clip pages in the text that, that you, that could be skipped over in order to maintain the whole, um, so we've done, but I've done both of those kinds of things in instruction. You know, cur- uh, curriculum makers now are trying, are developing or working with books that they, um, or texts that they, that can be done in a lesson or will purposefully go span over multiple lessons or be revisited. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that makes, makes the job easier. So much better about reading aloud to my three-year-old because I do just that sometimes. Right. <laughs> because even like the Dr. Seuss books, they're pretty long for a three-year-old. And I like, right. I just, I just shorten it up a little. <laughs> you know, I think about, right. So it's not that every word in the book. So I think sometimes parents and teachers are, um, get worried about, I have to cover every word in the book. And so stopping kids from talking and things like that. Mm-hmm. But Research on book reading has shown that those active conversations with children, in fact, um, a, a big area of research on this has been in preschool and dialogic reading. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and, and that's something that was developed by um, Russ Whitehurst and, and my colleagues um, here at FCRR, uh, Chris Lonigan and Beth Phillips has also been involved in. Um, in curricula that that use dialogic reading, and th- there's a lot of good evidence for the co- you know, the goal of that. Or one of the goals is to engage children in conversations, um, and and they become the storyteller. Um, and it's important. So it's I think sometimes we, th- in our thinking, at least in my thinking as a teacher, I wouldn't prioritize as much as I needed to the contribution that students make to the shared, the, the, you know, read aloud experience. Mm-hmm. Cause what you don't want happening is you don't want a child to like be spacing out during the read aloud. I think that actually, I think my seven year old is doing that right now <laughs> in school. I just met with the teacher yesterday and I'm like, I know that he could answer these simple questions about the story. He's just I think zoning he's, out. Yeah. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, you don't want to um, 
you want to make sure kids are are tracking with you. I'm not faulting yeah. the teacher. We have a wonderful teacher. Um, but it's it's just a personal reminder that it's the kids who we're trying to teach here. Right. Not the material we're trying to cover. Yeah. Which I think in the moment sometimes gets lost, right? You're like, it's easy to get lost. There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You As a teacher, you're a great lesson plan and you want to make sure you do it well. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you have the goal of ending it, right? You have the right. goal of ending yeah. it. So I just, I think it's, and I do think that research also has focused on what the teacher is doing. And I think that more research needs to focus on what the, the children's contributions, but the difficulty about that, unfortunately, from a research perspective is I think one of the reasons why the book reading literature and research hasn't, uh, the read aloud literature hasn't really focused on the interactions or the student, uh, what students are bringing to the table is because when you videotape book readings, unless you have special mic'd, um, and even when you have really great miking, um, you can't really capture what all the children are saying very clearly sometimes yeah. um, without being really intrusive. So yeah. it, it makes a really difficult circumstance as a researcher. <laughs> yeah. Turn and talk. And then there's 30 kids turning and talking. <laughs> right. right. And you're trying yeah. to see what they're all saying. <laughs> and turn and talk. I really like that method, um, uh, you know, to, to get all the students engaged mm -hmm. um, about the, the text. I like anything where like kids are actively engaged as much as possible. And it's like, that's what the turn and talk represents for me is that the students, it's not like a, a teacher student interaction, mm -hmm. right? It's like every student is sharing their thoughts with each other in response. And then they, you know, then the teacher can take a couple suggestions versus the teacher choosing one child. And then that one child has the experience of learning, but the other, you know, 29 say might not have to, they don't really have to think they can just right. listen. So I, yeah, I love any experience that gets every student involved as much as possible mm -hmm. in that learning experience. So and it doesn't have to be necessarily whole group. It can be a small group read aloud. You know, there could be different structures mm -hmm. um, that that you're using um, to to achieve those you know rich interactions that you're you're looking for. Um, you know, so that the the, the content rich uh, approaches seem to feature uh, coherent text sets through read alouds in the early earlier grades. So these coherent text sets where knowledge is being built and they don't, and the research in the research um, base uh, and a, a lot of the research base um, consists of not programs that are available for uh, to be used publicly, uh, but researcher developed programs or interventions that they, they developed that some of them are available publicly um, but most of the, uh, most of the extant studies in, in kindergarten through fifth grade that are either experiments or quasi experiments and exper they, experiments and quasi experiments both have, they feature a treatment group and some sort of comparison group in a, um, true experiment. Those groups are randomly assigned to that mm -hmm. condition. And in a quasi experiment, they're not randomly assigned. So that's just the difference between experiments and quasi-experiments. But when my colleague, uh, Heijin Huang, who's at the University of Minnesota, um, and I, um, along with our colleague, Rachel Joyner, um, looked at uh, all, all the studies that were available um, in the K through five space um, that integrated uh, content and literacy to some degree and had vocabulary and comprehension outcomes. And what we found, there was 35 of them. So it's not a huge amount. And in K2, there was like just a small handful of them. And uh, what, what we found was that, um, that integration versus like siloed traditional approaches um, what we found is that those integrated approaches um, mattered for children's vocabulary and comprehension, um, particularly on um, measures developed by the researchers or the more proximal measures, what I call more proximal, meaning kids learn the words that they're taught. They learn the, the knowledge that they're taught. Um, they learn, you know, they, they learn reading a passage that's closely related to what was taught. Um but then it also had generalized effects on comprehension. 
Um, I think this is still a growing area of research, uh, but one that merits, you know, that, you know, warrants some attention. And I think it's a pretty hot topic in the U.S. right now, this integrating content and literacy and the way that people are doing it in the United States right now, it seems like districts are doing it is through what I call content rich English language arts instruction, Mm -hmm. where the content is being pulled into English language arts. I was going to ask you to clarify that because I think as as secondary teachers too, we also would talk about bringing literacy into the content area. Absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) So yeah. So the, when I, when I talk about integrated approaches, um, and integrating content and literacy, I'm talking about any time of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, so what, yes. So a content literacy approach, like you mentioned, um, Melissa, where, um, where you're, you're doing content across, you know, you're bringing um, literacy into all the content areas, Mm -hmm. right. And in secondary, uh, you know, that has been an approach that has long been kind of espoused, I would say more in the older grades, um, than in the very youngest grades, um, namely because the very youngest grades often don't have a content, uh, much content instruction. Right. Um, whereas, um, um, you know, so I think that, that, that's true. And so we looked across both of those and there is some really great research on, um, on that integration in among the, in the older grades. Mm-hmm. Um, when I'm talking about content, rich English language arts instruction, I'm, I'm specifically talking about when content becomes a driving force in English language arts. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that these, uh, these content rich English language arts approaches are designed to meet all the content standards they're still designed to meet the ELA standards. Um, but, but some, but I would say most of the curricula that I'm familiar with that are being widely used, I don't know that they meet all of the content standards. Yeah. Cause I don't think that's the intention. That's right. right. I agree yeah. with you. I, I think that the, the curricula aren't designed to be used exclusively and then you don't have to teach content. Um, right. right. It's, it's designed to conti- you know, so you still need, across the day, something coherent that is going on across the day, um, where the content is speaking to the ELA instruction and vice versa. But what I have found in practice is that a lot of times, um, schools will make the decision to replace content teaching with one of the content rich English language arts curricula. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a mistake Mm -hmm because the designers of those curricula themselves would not say to do that. Right. So I, I, um, uh, you know, I know that for, for a fact, for like core knowledge language arts, I studied this program. I'm not a developer of the program. Um, this is a program that I, I did two randomized control trials on and in, for in kindergarten and, um, they, the developers would not say to not teach, you know, the content area, you know, they, they, it's not supposed to be a standalone. Um, but I think that there is such little content teaching going on that it gives some content, um, where there maybe was much less before. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to dive deeper into that, but first I'm wondering if you could clarify or explain Mm -hmm. what could this look like for like, if I were a student, could you walk me through the day? Like, what could this look like in a student's day? Like a day in the life of a student who, just so we can all ground (laughs) ourselves in, I'm a first or second grade student and and you, I mean, maybe kindergarten, you choose, you're the expert in the primary. (laughs) And I walk into school, I have, you know, I mean, a rough, rough glance. I have Mm -hmm. ELA, I have math, and then I have lunch and recess, and then I'm going on to the end of my day and I'm just... This is just my daughter's schedule. And then I have <laughs> science or social studies or health or one of those things. And then I go, like, what what would optimally happen in each – like, if you could build an optimal day, what would wow. that look like to be? <laughs> wow. That's – okay. So let me just talk – That's your first, next book. <laughs> I would say that we have some really great minds working on this in this space already, too. Um, so Nell Duke at the University of Michigan mm-hmm. has been developing curricula that – uh, cut across the entire day um, that are, is interdisciplinary and integrative um, and takes into account all these different areas. And I, and, and I, um, I sit on the um, 
advisory board for that and have been able to see um, what a feat it is because you, what you really need to have is people who are experts in all of these areas talking to one another um, because the expert, you can't just have a reading person guiding the whole day. Right. So I, I know, don't that's know. what I was thinking, you know, <laughs> right? like, even, like when I, ta- I, I taught fifth grade and I remember mm-hmm. being like, okay, I don't actually know what's happening. Like in, in that classroom over there, unless my, my co-teacher told me, but it was, Mm -hmm. you know, the kids were traveling and experiencing things throughout the day. So I only knew the sliver of what they were experiencing. Yes. So it is, it's tough because people, you know, the researchers or people doing the research need to talk to each other. People teaching need to talk to each other, the leaders, administration, you know, there needs to be a lot more collaboration going on in understanding. And at the, like you're at the school levels, what you're, you're talking about is like, even teachers might not know what's going on in other parts of the day for their student. So I, I can't say that I know the solution to that. Mm-hmm. But it, in a content-rich English language arts instruction, um, you know, what, make, what makes it distinct from traditional instruction is, uh, you know, the um, children are, uh, you know, instruction is designed around topics and not around themes. So a theme might be like our community or um, what can animals teach us or something like this. And then there might be many things you do during the week around this. Um, I would say traditional kind of uh, core reading programs are structured with themes, Mm -hmm. um, which is not, I'm not saying anything that's bad necessarily. I'm just saying that that's not necessarily content rich it's not like the content is the driver there where you have these content rich English language arts approaches that have that are uh, now very popular that drive with the content. So they, they, they drive with a set of topics like you might learn about farms and plants and, you know, so that that topic becomes, the, you know, there's some common features that re- that uh, in the research based approaches that are there among others, the ones that have been showing some effects and the, the, um, there's some common theme, uh, features in those. And one of them is that content is driven, uh, is, is, a, is a driver. So topics rather than the, uh, while all the English language art standards are covered, um, the topic becomes really important. Uh, the co use of coherent text sets with often the, um, interactive read alouds in, incorporated discussion and writing that is um, connected to the topic. So not discussion and writing for the sake of discussion and writing or for only like, oh, I have an inferential question here and I have a, mm-hmm. right? Or this is an open-ended question. This is a, you know, but rather how are we building that knowledge and how is the writing related to building that knowledge? And then the last feature is vocabulary. Um, uh, the vocabulary that's being taught they're also while the while general purpose words, which a lot of people think about as tier two words, are being taught. Um, there's also the the more content specific words that are being taught, and they're being taught in relationship with one another. So through the texts that are read, through the vocabulary, the deepening of the vocabulary, you see that in these approaches, um, and then you see that in also then play out in the widely used curricula, content rich ELA curricula that makes it distinct from the, um, from the traditional curricula. Yeah. Yeah. So just to kind of like put a pin on that, like if I'm a student, I walk in, I experience that, um, you know, high quality experience in ELA that's content rich, everything that you just explained, then I would go on with my day, but I would still, still be receiving instruction in science and social studies. And I think that that's where it gets confusing because the right. topics sometimes in right. LA, right? right, or oftentimes in the content rich are, are science related or history related. So right. it is, it is difficult to kind of like parse out mm-hmm. um, for teachers to say like, well, we didn't already teach science or we didn't already teach social things. We talk yeah. topics related to those in ELA, but it's also still important that students are, you know, experiencing the science curriculum where they're doing experiments and they're learning the scientific processes that they're, you know, not learning in ELA. It, like, I just want to make sure that we yes. stamp that and that's an accurate way for me <laughs> to describe that. And if not, please correct me. Yes. I think, I think that that is a 
what you're describing, I think is a very valid concern is that, um, and that I would say that my, um, probably my science education colleagues, you know, uh, you know, at professors would have this concern of, you can't, you know, science is inquiry based. There are, you know, um, it's, and in fact, one of my colleagues is like, she would never start with a read aloud. She would start with some sort of hands-on activity, then move into a read aloud. You know, so I think that reading shouldn't take over science and social studies, but rather supplement the, rather provide a supplement. So it could be that certain topics are first covered in science and social studies, and then they appear in English language arts, or maybe it, maybe you're able to sync your whole curriculum at the same time where you're covering the same topic in, uh, you know, as you're going. I think it's difficult. And this is why I think we need solutions, um, more solutions that think about the relationship between those two. Mm-hmm. Um, like, um, I think the core knowledge, uh, foundation has set, has, has thought through sets of both of those areas. And I don't know about the other, um, large publishers, but they probably also have science and social studies pieces that they sell separately. Um, that would probably go along with their English language arts, but but meet the science standards, right? Sure. And yeah. provide children with the hands-on um, experiences that they need to really engage in inquiry and um, discipline the disciplines of this, you know, science and social studies disciplines, and it not be all about book reading. Yeah, I would imagine too. This would be really helpful in the primary grades when you are teaching the whole day, like as a teacher, just planning for the day. (laughs) Because I'm thinking as a secondary teacher, like if I, okay, if we are building knowledge for the, you know, a whole module on the Civil War, but I know they're, you know, they, they actually learned about that last year. Okay, that's fine, though, but they can build, bring all that knowledge they brought from social studies Mm -hmm. to my class when we're reading about the Civil War in my ELA class. But in the primary grades, I would imagine, like, when you're planning for the whole day, (laughs) that might get a lot trickier and it might, might just feel better to, you know, when you talk about like Nell Dukes, um, you know, what's, what does a full integrated day look like? It Mm -hmm. might, it might just be a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that there's, there's no easy answers, but you, Melissa, you're bringing up a really important point. And that is that um, teachers need to kind of be aware what children have already learned Mm -hmm. in what various grades, even if it's the grades before them, not just early in the year. So they can then activate that background knowledge as you're starting to learn new knowledge. So you can integrate your prior learning with your new knowledge and um, that importance of the, um, you know, we've for many, many years, we harped on the importance of activating background knowledge. Um, And now kind of the focus is on building background knowledge Mm -hmm. because what if there is no knowledge to activate, but as students are, having um, content rich kinds of curricula uh, there's more of an opportunity to, for teachers to make sure that they know what, what is the sequence of when it was taught so they can activate that prior learning. Yeah. You know what that makes me think of is when I was in the, when I was a teacher, I remember having students do like this, whenever anybody talks about this, this vivid memory stands out to me. I remember having students do a a KWL, right? Mm -hmm. What you know, what you think, you know, what you learned. And all of the, what, like when I was walking around, I was looking at what they know. I remember thinking, huh, a lot of the things they know or they think they know are not accurate. (laughs) Mm -hmm. These are misconceptions. So I was like, that's, this is, I almost wondered like, was it harming them Mm -hmm. to, or hurting them? In, to write down and like as you write, you're kind of stamping right something in your brain. Yeah. To write what they think they knew that was totally wrong. Mm-hmm. And but it was also helpful like, for you as a teacher. To it was know very that. helpful for me. I know. I just <laughs> I remember vividly thinking like, oh my gosh, they don't, they don't. The, what I you know they don't really know. Very, they have such inaccurate knowledge right mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. And how am I going to you know get them accurate knowledge so that they can access what they're what they need to know. <laughs> yeah. So I think, I think it is, it's in the revisiting of those inaccuracies because yeah. ignoring those. And, you know, I, I agree with you that putting a, you don't want to just put a stamp on it and say, yeah, 
that's great. The <laughs> right. sun does right. rise in the west or whatever. Right. Um, you but you want to there's might you might have a time when they can share what they think that they know, and then you revisit some of those things and say, okay, does the sun rise in the West? Am I am I right? Hold on. Sun rise in the east and says in the west. Okay, yep. yeah. That's right. so, <laughs> I got a background check myself. Um, so um, you know, um, so you don't want to just leave those hanging when you know that right. there are inaccuracies. Right. There, you know, sometimes also teachers though feel that they don't have enough knowledge to teach um themselves uh accurately. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really valid concern. Um mm-hmm. And I think that that's what some of these curricula are trying to help offer teachers yeah. is enough knowledge um, or ways to also gain some of that knowledge to be able to teach um, the, the the content more accurately. Because, you know, it's not that traditional English language arts instruction is devoid of content. It's just that the content skips around a lot. So right. it, it doesn't privileges. Go very deep. Yeah. So it privileges children who have the background knowledge already and that can uptake the new things that are being learned um, rather than sticking on a topic and building that prior knowledge in order to uh, be able to uptake the next topic as well. That's right. Yeah, that's a really good point to bring up, though, about the teachers, though. And I think it's I mean, it's good for us to just say it that, you know, some of these topics are pretty in depth. And I know I mean. One of the topics I'm writing about right now is like the Nez Perce tribe, which I knew nothing about before I started writing this curriculum. But now I know a lot, (laughs) you know, but for teachers picking it up and teaching it, we have to figure out how to get them that knowledge so they feel as comfortable teaching it as well. Yeah, exactly. And so I would say, again, it is not um, the fault of teachers. I would feel the same way right now about a whole host of topics with first graders, (laughs) you know. And I mean, I have a first grader at home and I know that they're, I'm like, huh, am I telling, we need to look this up. He asked me questions. I'm like, I have no idea. I know. How did parents parent before Google? I have no idea. (laughs) Libraries. They went to the library. And looked into encyclopedias. Oh yeah. Encyclopedias. Encyclopedias. Thank you. Yeah. I know. I sometimes think that too. I'm like, how did we all grow up? I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> yes. Well, and it is funny too, because they think that you know every, I mean, they think you have all the answers. So they ask right. these big questions. And you're like, I'm not quite sure. But I love, you said yesterday, you said language and knowledge are intertwined and take time to grow. Mm-hmm. And I think that just speaks to what you just shared so much. Yes. I think, you know, unfortunately, everybody really wants a quick fix. Mm-hmm. And, but, and, and, and people think like, oh, children are, you know, they're in fourth grade. They're not doing well. They're, they're reading comprehension. It's not going well. But if that language and that knowledge wasn't built up all along, this is probably one of the reasons why it's not going well. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, it's very hard to quick fix that yeah. because unlike other skills, um, you know, when we think about the skills needed to decode words um, and for the beginning reader there, you know, some people call it constrained skills. There's a finite set of alphabet letters, you know, there's a finite way they go together and things like this. Whereas the language is like a lot more unconstrained. I'm not saying it's more important, but it is equally as important to build language and knowledge early on that language comprehension side of the rope of Scarborough's rope you were talking about, you yeah. know, it's equally as important to grow that um, tech area early on. And you might not see the immediate benefit in the reading scores, their early reading scores, because you're not testing the language areas yet. You're testing yeah. the decoding areas. And then you'll really see the benefit as children move up. And then also, you know, there's benefit of the language and vocabulary to decoding as well. Mm-hmm. So um, if a child doesn't have a certain word in their lexicon already, how are they going to decode it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. That's it's so important. And I, I always think about teachers, you know, who have who have said things, um, you know, ask like just in conversation. My friends who are teachers are like, well, can you share how how are like who primary teachers? How are students able to? you know, comprehend, uh, this rich text when they can't 
read the words yet. And that is something that sticks with me because I think it is so fundamental to primary teachers to put one thing first and the, you know, put to put the, the word recognition first and the language comprehension second. And what I would say is it's a both and. It's not, it an e- it's not either or. It's and, absolutely a both and. Yeah. And to ex- I, I'm so glad that you that, – well, first of all, I'm so glad that your work is in the primary space <laughs> because you. that really does help kind of debunk that – thought. And again, by no fault of anyone, especially our beloved mm-hmm. teachers, yep. it's just what we were taught and what Absolutely. we've been ingrained to think. So I'm so glad that you're doing the work in that space, because I think once you hit kind of third grade, it does kind of automatically debunk in the way mm-hmm. that we've been taught over long periods of time, you know, like that. I, I love that we're debunking, like <laughs> learning to read, reading to learn. You right. know, like I try exactly. never to say that. <laughs> right. And, you know, and teachers still do say that. And, you know, that is, um, that was a, you know, that was uh, from Jean Chal, who was amazing researcher and um, from Harvard University. And, uh, you know, I've heard a colleague describe that really well um, as more of a description of development and less of a not not a way to instruct. Mm-hmm. So she wasn't talking about instruction. And so um, you you are always learning to, uh, you know, um, you're so, so you're always reading to learn from the very beginning. And I would say that the, the language and knowledge piece of it, the, the language comprehension piece of it starts, you know, you're at birth, you're yes. get opening, you know, um, those conversations early, even before children are able to do back and forth with you. They're still even little babies are doing back and forths with Cueing. you in yeah. they're doing proto conversations. Yeah. Right. And so um, you're building that the language repertoire right from the beginning. And I think it's really hard to pass, to parse language and knowledge because um, they're just so closely, closely linked uh, our experiences, the way we think about them and language. I still, I think that they're distinct, but I think that they're just so intertwined. Um, So we need to build them early. And I think, you know, reading aloud is a, is a ubiquitous practice in the early grades, right? Um, and thinking about the read aloud as a vehicle for, um, the, uh, for conversations, for building language skills in ways that matter for children, uh, making sure that they're part of the conversation. Um, you know, that's what I was thinking that reading to learn, like it, it counts if the, someone's reading it aloud to them. Like, it does that count, counts yes. <laughs> Absolutely. as reading to learn. <laughs> exactly. That's what you know. And, um, you, you know, uh, my colleagues, Gina Cervetti and Freddie Heber have a nice, um, paper and reading teacher. Um, I, I forgot what year it was, but it, I think it was about, about this sixth pillar of reading instruction. And they talk about knowledge and, um, they make that point. Mm. Um, and the, it, it is important, important, important to know that reading to learn happens even when they're unable to decode the words yes. themselves, because w- when they are able to decode words, um, they're, uh, they need to be able to understand what's go- with their, what that, you know, what they're reading. They right. also need to have some of those words in their lexicon to even decode them. And then, and they need to understand different text structures. They need to understand all these things that we're just like, why don't you get this? Well, if they were not exposed to those things, there'd be no reason for them to get it. Such a good point. <laughs> Mic drop. all right do is there anything else Sonia that you want to share about from your research or anything before we ask you I know you're really excited for our last five questions (laughs) (laughs) the rapid fire question lightning round I would I would I think I would like to say that um you know it is that there is a lot of really promising research um in the early grades about this in integration between content and literacy. Um, and I think that the place that I'm, you know, pressing my research forward on is understanding, continuing to understand um, kind of the mechanisms as to why that might be the case. Um, and I do think about the teacher, how, how the, the context or the, you know, what teachers are talking about, teaching about affects their, the ways they model language for children. So um, I think this is a, I think it's 
a really important, um, you know, uh, discussion uh, to think about and to think about how we can reintegrate content and literacy instruction in ways that improve both content and literacy instruction uh, knowledge for kids. This just makes me so happy. This whole, yeah. The whole topic makes me so happy. <laughs> We're just going to block your calendar off for the rest of the day. Keep talking. No problem. <laughs> <Love it>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are we ready for our final five questions? Yes. Go for All right. it. All okay. right. So our five things that you love, we'll start out <laughs> with what do you love to read? Okay. I'm really into young adult literature. Uh, a lot, you know, where there's often a love triangle feature, Ooh. you know, the Twilight series, or I'm reading one right now called Matched. Don't tell me how it ends. I haven't mm. finished it. I don't but know that one. <laughs> I love the you don't, you don't, do you have dystopian a, Do you have genre. like a tween? No, I'm a tween at heart. Okay, so, so because when you said that, I was like, I am lo- also can you really <laughs> connect with this. But what? I don't think you have, from what you said earlier. I was like, no, I have a seven year old. But what really made me excited about this was in my master's program, I took a young adult literature class mm-hmm. and I started reading it. I'm like, oh, I really like this. And so, but it's the young adult dystopian fiction. So, you know, Divergent, Hunger Games, oh, I love all those, those kinds of Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This one's a good one. Okay. What do you love to binge watch? <laughs> well, if though if those um, are made into movies and stuff, those are really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, um, but I, I would say um, my go to series are like The Office. You know, love The oh Office. Oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've watched The Office. I know, <laughs> me too. Um, and then there's this there's this new one that I've been binge watching, and it's been a strange binge watch for me. It's on YouTube. It's the Behavior Panel guys, and there are four guys who break down behavior and tell tell you if people are lying oh. and the different things that they're doing um you know if you know, the, the how, how their face should be you know where they're like if they're having grief it should show up in the forehead and in the chin uh, how what, you know it's just fascinating what they do is they watch a yeah. bunch of baseline for somebody how they normally act and then see how they're acting so they do this with contempt you know oh things gosh. that are going on right now like that's i think today's video that's dropping is about amber heard <laughs> oh, that's, good. that's probably gonna be very controversial no look comment that up. <laughs> all right what do you love to listen to um uh, right now i have uh olivia rodrigo on repeat mm. i'm really liking that sour album you, but- you are a tween at heart <laughs> I, I love me some Taylor Swift too. Yeah. Um, I am a tween at heart. I think I stayed, I, I, I'm 15 forever, actually. I, that's when I'm I I'm going to send you like a tie dye crop top for, with, that says Melissa and Lori love literary. So you can just wear that all day. I was, <laughs> that's funny. Um, but, you know, I met my husband when I was 15 and he was 17 and we just celebrated our 24th anniversary like oh the gosh. other day. Congrats. And um, I used to pray, please let the first boy I kiss be the man I marry. He's the only boy I ever kiss. But um, oh, he see. is. He is, uh, I'm still stuck at 15 and we always make a joke of that. Like I am still stuck there. <laughs> well, I love, it's a good place to be stuck, right? <laughs> yeah. It's past middle school. <laughs> right. I had to make it past middle school. Oh, couldn't be stuck at middle school. Please Lord. No. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So and not middle school. You probably won't give a middle school answer for this next one. <laughs> what is a memory you love as a teacher or as a student? Mm. I really loved when I was teaching second grade that you can really see kind of students light up when they were doing something that they enjoyed so much. Mm -hmm. I remember in my class, students would be, um, one student was so interested in writing plays. He later up, he grew later on, he grew up to be in the theater, but Mm -hmm. he was so interested in this. And I loved kind of, um, paying attention to their interests and helping them develop some of those interests. So it was exciting to me to uh, see them doing what they loved. Um, And those are the, I think those are the things I tend to remember about my time and how much, how much, you know, I think the thing, the special thing about being a teacher is you develop those relationships with the students and they all, they, they do feel like, I cried at the end of each year and I, you know, you just love them and you, you want the best for them Mm -hmm. Uh, and they love you. 
and you're a celebrity everywhere you go. Like oh I go God. to their soccer game and they're like, oh, Mrs. Campbell is here, Mrs. Campbell so is here. It is really fun to do that. Yeah. I also love it when you like I, I when you see a student out like outside of school and like years later and mm-hmm. they're like, oh, Miss Sappington? You know, and then they're like so excited to tell you what they've done since you've been. It's just the sweetest. Like it never gets old. <laughs> it, it's so sweet. And uh, you know, but you realize, wow, they're Facebook friends and they're like now they're now adults. Um yeah, it just makes you realize how time passes. Like okay. I'm still 15, remember? <laughs> time really, really passed. <laughs> Funny. Our last question is, why do you do what you love for literacy? Mm, That's a good question. Um, I think reading is one of the most important skills that we can have, and it opens the door to everything in our lives. Um, It opens the door to spiritual things. It opens the door to learning about new things. It it gives opportunities. Uh, You know, there's just so much about reading and uh, that matters for life. Um, so I just always loved the idea of, you know, helping children learn to read. And I think that was one of my driving factors. And when I was teaching too, before I, you know, specialized in reading, I, uh, I just always had the belief that of that reading was underlied so many other things and if you could learn how to read, you could do anything. So I loved, uh, I, I still love reading. I think it's one of the um, best things. And when I think about reading, though, I say reading, but I also mean writing. So mm-hmm. I, I, I think yeah. reading and writing, right? Um, maybe some other time we could talk about writing in a podcast. Yes. <laughs> Write it down, Lori. Yes. <laughs> well, it has been an honor to talk with you. And we're so grateful for everything you do for students and teachers and your research is so important and your, I mean, your work is so important every day. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you. And thank you for doing what you're doing and elevating different voices and, um, you know, reaching so many teachers and uh, to all the teachers out there. Thank you for all of you for what you do every day. It is an extremely hard job and there is not enough thanks given to our teachers Um, And I think that I think in the pandemic, um, people began to realize how much teachers do. And I really um, I can't stress more how much I admire teachers and uh, um, and I have so much respect for teaching. Could not agree more. <laughs> I know. I we need to we need to have Melissa and Lori love literacy shirts that said just like we just love teachers. Yeah, yes. we love are teachers. so grateful to you. <laughs> Thank you for taking our children and making them better people every day. Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, yes, Sonia. This is such a treat. Having you. I appreciate being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, Literacy Lovers. We release a new podcast episode every Friday and share more resources in a newsletter on Tuesday. Sign up for our newsletter at literacypodcast.com. Each week, you'll receive important information, resources, and connected content. We're excited to create a space for community discussion about our podcast. We want to connect with our listeners and support you in answering your questions. But we also realize there are a lot of other educators out there who have great advice and experience, too. Let's keep learning together in our Melissa and Lori Love Literacy podcast Facebook group. And be sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If the content in this episode helped you, share with a fellow educator and teacher friend. Our Literacy Lover community welcomes educators at every stage of their learning journey. We're so glad you're here to learn with us. The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests of the Melissa and Lori Love Literacy Podcast in this episode are not necessarily the opinions of Great Minds PEC or its employees.